My name is Carolyn Skipper. This is a, more of a comment to David Orr about money and politics. And I just want to mention there is a nationwide movement called Move to Amend to try to get an amendment to the Constitution to say that corporations are not people, which will help with that. So just to let people know, there is some groundwork on that issue that is very important. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, next question. Uh, if you want to bring those up, I can read questions that were submitted in writing. Thank you. Uh, the questioner says, democracy depends on the freedom of all people to be able to run for election as much as people have the right to vote. What can be done to prohibit the two parties in power uh, to require independents to have to submit thousands of more petition uh, signatures uh, than the two uh, parties in power uh, have to raise? As a technical matter, the established parties get to be on the ballot with five-tenths of one percent of the voters signing petitions, whereas the new parties require five to eight uh, percent. David, I think this comment might uh, uh, be more in your bailiwick. <laughs> well, it's a tough struggle uh, for the reasons we're talking about, meaning that the, the power, in this case of both parties, at least in Illinois and most places, don't want what you're suggesting to happen and they have the power to do it to the legislature. Uh, when in fact, if you had third parties, for example, that did not have to have all the candidates front, let's take an example, um, they refer to this fusion, but if you allow, for example, a third party to exist and not have so many petitions, et cetera, and also if you allow them to pick and choose among their candidates, like they used to do in New York, um, otherwise, uh, you're not going to be successful. But it's simply, um, like all the struggles we're talking about, the legislature doesn't want to do it. So what you have to do is you have to find enough people in both parties um, and people who are independent-minded to put the pressure on. Uh, it's something that can be won, but as long as the dominant parties don't want it to happen, we have just a situation where, unfortunately, without, with these hard challenges for uh, petitions. Other states don't do it like Illinois. A lot of states don't have this petition requirement, uh, which is ridiculous. In my book also, the challenges, as you know. So there are other things that we're look, looking at on, around, on the electoral boards. There were Rich Means is, is, a, is an expert to try and um, have fair hearings when your petitions or your candidacy is challenged. That's something else we're working on as we speak, and we've made some, some improvements in the legislature. But this one, if you really want to reduce the petition requirement and or allow third parties to flourish, you'd have to get the legislator uh, to change, which means a good old-fashioned big fight. We need the, the moral Mondays in Illinois. Okay. Uh, this has been a long fight, and uh, I've had a number of cases. Uh, uh, one of them, as early as 1971, in the Seventh Circuit for the Court of Appeals, and they turned us down. And so it's been a fight for a long time. But let's go to another subject. Uh, uh, is there, Judith uh, Brown Dianas, uh, you've given us the call to action and told us some of the challenges uh, that we're facing now. Part of the problem may be that not much money or advertising is going in to inform people who are being disenfranchised or threatened with disenfranchisement that 
they need to go to the polls, they need to register. What's being done about that? Um, so, so for the people who have not registered, well, let me just let me step back to the to the ID piece because I think there has been um, basically what has happened with the courts is that these states that implement voter ID are supposed to give free ID, um, and they are supposed to do an education, have an education plan for letting people know that they actually need to have the ID. What has happened, though, is that plaintiffs, like the plaintiffs that we represent in court, um, actually can't just go get the free ID because actually you have to have the birth certificate in order to get the ID. And many people can't afford the birth certificate, or we have a lot of elderly folks who, in fact, don't have a birth certificate, weren't born in a hospital, um, or um, you know, don't have access to it, um, we have married women who have to produce a marriage certificate in order to show that their name has changed. Um, and there are a lot of people who have documents that don't match up. And so when they go to try and get the ID, they have a problem. Um, there has been a lot, there is a lot of advertising going on or GOTV um, to get people out to vote. Um, as you can imagine, the parties do a lot of that. Um, Nonpartisan groups, we also do GOTV work in trying to get people out to vote. Um, quite frankly, we have, um, you know, we have a, a system of, of an, a society of apathy in some ways because people don't necessarily connect voting to change. Um, as you can imagine, all of the things that happened in St. Louis with, um, with the shooting in Ferguson, um, there's a lot of activism. Um, in fact, in Ferguson, they actually had a huge number of people register to vote. Um, because we're starting to connect the dots for people on the real issues in their lives, the day-to-day -day bread and butter issues. Um, so there is a lot of work going on to get people out to vote and make sure that they know all of the requirements, even in those states that do have voter ID now in Texas. Everybody's going to have to ch turn their attention from fighting the lawsuit to now making sure that people can get the ID, which is going to be very difficult. In Wisconsin, I can tell you the judge said, Judge Posner said that in order to get ID in the hands of everybody in Wisconsin that would have needed it, they would have had to issue 6,000 IDs per day between now and election day to be able to get those people to vote. Come on up to the mic. Hi, I was very impressed with what you said, Judith Brown, and I was just a little bit concerned. I'm, I'm part of the Sierra Club, so I'm out here trying to make sure I can this was. Um, you keep telling us about these various states that's popping up and they're just with the voter ID. For us to prevent that, do, does it have to rewrite the <clears throat> Section 5 of the Constitution? to prevent these states from continuously popping up and trying to continue out the suit? Sure. So, um, so there's two things that have to be done. One is that we do need to have a Voting Rights Act amendment. Um, there are efforts underway in Washington, D.C. with civil rights organizations that are um, trying to get a new Voting Rights Act passed, right? That it will be an amendment that will give us back Section 5. Um, quite frankly, it's not as strong right now as it needs to be. And this is not a Congress that's going to pass a very good Voting Rights Act amendment. It's just not going to happen. Um, and then the other piece that I was talking about is that we have to get to the point of having a constitutional amendment that actually makes explicit the right to vote. Because what that would do is that it would require, if any state um, like North Carolina or Wisconsin comes up with a new law that infringes on the right to vote, they would have to have a compelling reason. So all those bogus claims of fraud would not have passed. They wouldn't have been able to do it, or they would have been able to do it, and we would have won in court like this. And so that's part of what we're trying to do, is strengthen the right to vote. Because right now, the courts have eviscerated it. 
The courts, with Bush, starting with Bush v. Gore and probably even before that, the courts have said that voting really is not fundamental and that it's not a sacred right, and we want to make it that again. Um, it, it was, it's so powerful having you and Mr. Black here who lived the struggle in those days. And it was so powerful to hear you say to us, you know, people died for the right to vote. Um, and yes. I, I just wondered if maybe you could uh, tell a, a story, you know, the, the stories of what you, a story of what you actually experienced, maybe in Mississippi. Uh, as part of a, a meeting, was there a campaign going on then, like we're talking about having to have a campaign going on now? Can you think of an evening or something that you were preparing to, to do that was part of the struggle to... Back then? Yeah, back then. First of all, there were no campaigns for blacks, you know. Uh, it just didn't happen. Um, <clears throat> My particular position was um, I worked in voter rights, and my p responsibility was to get out there in the small hamlets and cities in, of Mississippi, especially southern Mississippi, and teach blacks the voter registration process. We were not going to be able to vote. Okay, We were not going to be able to vote, but we had to make the attempt, the mandate that I worked on there actually came down from the NAACP. Uh, they wanted to know how many blacks would vote if they could vote. Okay? Out of, for instance, if I took down to the courthouse 100 people to attempt to register to vote after we schooled them in the state constitution and all the other processes handed down by Mississippi, maybe we might get two people to vote. And nine times out of 10, the circuit clerk knew those two people or were friends with them. So that's just how difficult it was to get, you know, to get registered. And, uh, I would go out and teach them the process, and um, most of the town, most of the times, it was the state secretary, NAACP state circuit secretary, Mega Everest. His contacts, okay, p would put their request in to him, and he would notify us and find out if we could go. As the Tougaloo students, that we were all, there were about. 25 or 30 of, of us who were in that position that he would contact and send us out to various places. So that's what I did. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much for what you did. <clears throat> now that uh, voter ID is going to be required in Texas, there are still things that can be done. One of the things, of course, is to let people know about it uh, by having forums like we have here. But Judith, can you expand on what else can be done uh, in places like Texas where the courts aren't helping, they're putting things on hold, but people can still do things? Sure. Um, so in a place like Texas, I mean, the, the biggest problem with Texas is that the, um, the state is going to have to do an advertising plan um, to let people know about this new requirement. And then people are going to have to scramble for um, the documentation to get the ID. Uh, and to get to DMV offices. Part of the problem in a place like Texas and even what we found in Wisconsin is that a lot of these offices are not um, close by. You know, in Texas it's spread out um, and they're not open every day and they're not open, a lot of them, on weekends. Um, so now what is happening is that there are groups on the ground that are local civic engagement groups. 
um, that will be doing the work of trying to get people to DMV offices. This is, I mean, this is like old school organizing, right, of getting those people in vans and getting them down to these offices to get ID. Um, and one of the things that they also have to do is that we have got to turn out the vote. Um, because it is in these so-called off years, right? If we look back, this was 2010 that gave us this, right? And it's because people didn't turn out in record numbers like they do in presidential elections. And so part of what is happening in all of these states is that civic engagement groups are really doing a very kind of doubling down on GOTV efforts. Um, because we know that what will happen is if you get, if you continue to get bad people in the legislature, you're going to continue to see this backward sliding. And so that's really where the fight is now. It's now around turnout over the next few weeks. Um, it's around trying to get some last, you know, remnants of people ID if they can get it. Um, and then there's going to be the fight on the other side. Um, after election day to really fight back on these laws. And Texas, it's not over because Texas and, and Wisconsin, we will probably see those cases um, in the Supreme Court again because they, the Supreme Court did not rule on the merits of those cases. And so we will see voter ID in the Supreme Court. Ma'am, go ahead. Hi, my name is Stephanie Miller. I represent two organizations, the League of Women Voters for Oak Park River Forest, as well as Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated, the Glen Ellen Area Alumni Chapter. Um, my question is for uh, Mrs. Diaz. We are two very large organizations, very active in making sure that everyone's right to vote is something that's realized. And I would like to know what we can do to, um, I guess, have a very strong advocacy in having those constitutional laws that you're saying needs to have changed because of the things that are creeping in to make um, the fraud that's happening against a lot of voters something that's happening more and more. So I would just like to know how we can better organize what we can do um, to start putting our feet on the ground and getting these laws changed. Sure, so I think that one thing that we have not done in this country is that, I, Part of what we want, we want to do with this right to vote amendment is make voting and the right to vote as important as guns and free speech. People fight for free speech and guns, but we don't fight for the right to vote. And so we've got to make it so that this is the fight of our lives, right? And it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, Republican or Democrat, really. We should all care about the right to vote. And so part of what we need to do is that when you're doing civic engagement work, don't just do it around election time. People hate when you come and knock on their door and tell them to register and tell them to vote and you don't engage them the rest of the year because they feel like they're being used. And so we've got to be able to engage them year round around the issues that matter to them, doing the old fashioned organizing. So what are the top three issues on your plate? And organizing them around the calendar so that they understand that civic engagement does not end on election day. That now you have to hold people accountable. And then once you hold them accountable, when they come up for election again, you have a, a time to give them a report card. Right? And so we've got to do this year in and year out so that people understand the full cycle of civic engagement. And then that will give us people who are more informed and who care about voting. And so that's my, my key is don't stop after election day. People, and, and also connecting the dots. You care about policing, then you need to care about a mayor who appoints a police chief. You care about policing, you probably should care about whoever the prosecutor is. You care about mass incarceration. You care about school closures in Chicago. You better care about who that mayor is because he's doing a horrible thing here to children in Chicago. Um, I'm sorry, for those who don't know, we actually filed a Title VI complaint around the school closure of Diet High School here. Um, 
which is being investigated by the Department of Education. And so I think just making those connections to everyday issues for people and not just waiting till November. Mr. Black wanted to speak. Let's have one last question and then the discussion will continue in Unity House just across the, uh, the foyer. We have coffee and cookies and cider waiting for everybody and a whole lot more conversation. So, sir, go ahead. I'd like to say something before. Tim, yes, go. Go ahead. Uh, really quick. And just to go forward on what our brilliant panel and particularly our attorney said, and being an ordinary person, I will say to each one of you, it takes ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And so don't underestimate your importance. Now, I happen to know, as a matter of personal experience, with ordinary and doing the impossible is always possible. And we can look at the President of the United States as an example of that. Who would have thought even 12 years ago that this man would be there? But it took organizing, community organizing, those units in the community that you have contacts with, your churches. That's where we started with Barack. He was not in the politics early. He was in community organizing. How did I, Father Plager, Reverend Jeremiah Wright, and on and on we can go with people who already had concerns but wanted to get politicians in office that could address those. Whether it happened or not, that's another question. But it took ordinary people to bring, and we had many examples of this in the civil rights era. And needing, therefore, the, the kind of professionalism, the expertiseism that our panel has here, then they can do, they can move forward more easily because they have the academic and the professional experience and knowledge that we have brought to them. Fannie Lou Hamer in Mississippi was an ordinary person. She started a movement. In, 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 in the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement, it, it took ordinary people to get to Dr. King. He didn't start it, but he was a person that they went to as ordinary people and said, this is our problem. We have a major problem here in America. Voter rights is a major problem, which will affect each one of us if we do not help to break that barrier that they're trying to put up now. So, old man, just been here a long time, uh, but think about it. Thank you, Tim. Go ahead. Um, I just want to we are dealing with an extreme uh, radical school board. Uh, I just want to let everybody will know that it's those off-year spring elections that we have in Illinois that drive me crazy because you can, he won, the, the president of the board who's giving us so very much trouble, uh, won by only 48 votes out of 50,000 people who live in that district. He only won by 48 votes. And I have a question for Mr. Orr. Why do we even have spring odd year elections? Why don't we just push them back into the November election? Or is that something we have to do to the legislature? Because I don't understand why we couldn't take care of it now. If, if I understood it right, you're asking why you, you may suggest we might go back to having fall school board elections? Because they didn't work. Um, I can take credit for that, so you can blame me if you don't agree. Um, we used to have, in odd years, you'd have these uh, municipal elections in the spring. In November, you'd have another election, which cost a lot of money, and the turnout would often be 2 to 4 to 6%. Um, so very few people vote in those school boards, so we felt it would be better to push that all together into the spring, okay? And so actually, it's still low, but it's higher turnout we have in the spring on school boards and before. Remember, as we said before, people in power often don't want, they want to make petitions hard for their opponents or particularly for third parties. Uh, people in power often don't want those people to vote. 
I mean, we could have really robust school board elections if we did them by mail. If we offered that right now for the school board elections coming up, they, they, we could get a good turnout. Uh, but many folks in power don't want the big turnout, including sometimes the schools we're talking about. They feel they got a better chance of winning the referendum, which is often an increase in money, if just a few people know. So there's all these things that go into it. But the bottom line is I would suggest we're better off the way we are today, but we still need to try and find ways for uh, you know, better education. Um, it, it's a classic thing about why few people vote on these important school board matters. And if we, if, consider that. If we do move toward mail, um, I think we'd have a much higher turnout. Thank you.